each by Franz Fanon at the Congress of Black African Writers, 1959, Wretched of the Earth, Reciprocal Bases of National Culture and the Fight for Freedom, Source, reproduced from Wretched of the Earth, 1959, published by Pelican, Speech to Congress of Black African Writers. Colonial domination, because it is total and tends to oversimplify, very soon manages to disrupt in spectacular fashion the cultural life of a conquered people. This cultural obliteration is made possible by the negation of national reality, by new legal relations introduced by the occupying power, by the banishment of the natives and their customs, to outlying districts by colonial society, by expropriation, and by the systemic enslaving of men and women. Three years ago, at our first Congress, I showed that, in the colonial situation, dynamism is replaced fairly quickly by a substantification of the attitudes of the colonizing power. The area of culture is then marked off by fences and signposts. These are in fact so many defense mechanisms of the most elementary type, comparable for more than one good reason to the simple instinct for preservation. The interest of this period for us is that the oppressor does not manage to convince himself of the objective non-existence of the oppressed nation and its culture. Every effort is made to bring the colonized person to admit the inferiority of his culture, which has been transformed into instinctive patterns of behavior, to recognize the unreality of his nation, and in the last extreme, the confused and imperfect character of his own biological nature. Vis-a-vis -vis this state of affairs, the natives' reactions are not unanimous. While the mass of the people maintain intact traditions which are completely different from those of the colonial situation, and the artisan style solidifies into a formalism which is more and more stereotyped, the intellectual throws himself in frenzied fashion into the frantic acquisition of the culture of the occupying power and takes every opportunity of unfavorably criticizing his own national culture, or else take refuge in setting out and substantiating the claims of that culture in a way that is passionate but rapidly becoming unproductive. The common nature of these two reactions lies in the fact that they both lead to impossible contradictions. Whether a turncoat or a substantialist, the native is ineffectual precisely because the analysis of the colonial situation is not carried out on strict lines. The colonial situation calls a halt to national culture in almost every field. Within the framework of colonial domination, there is not and there will never be such phenomena as new cultural departures or changes in the national culture. Here and there, valiant attempts are sometimes made to reanimate the cultural dynamism and give fresh impulses to its themes, its forms, and its tonalities. The immediate, palpable, and obvious interest of such leaps ahead are nil. But if we follow up the consequences to this very end, we see that preparations are being thus made to brush the cobwebs off national consciousness, to question oppression, and to open up the struggle for freedom. A national culture under colonial domination is a contested culture whose destruction is sought in systemic fashion. It is very quickly becomes a culture condemned to secrecy. This idea of clandestine culture is immediately seen in the reactions of the occupying power, which interprets attachment traditions as faithfulness to the spirit of the nation and as a refusal to submit. This persistence in following forms of culture which are already condemned to extinction is already a demonstration of nationality, but is a demonstration which is a throwback to the laws of inertia. 
There is no taking of the offensive and no redefining of relationships. There is simply a concentration on a hard core of culture which is being more and more shriveled up, inert and empty. By the time a century or two of exploitation has passed, there comes about a veritable emaciation of the stock of national culture. It becomes a set of automatic habits, some traditions of dress and a few broken down institutions. Little movement can be discerned in such remnants of culture. There is no real creativity and no overflowing life. The poverty of the people, national oppression and the inhibition of culture are one and the same thing. After a century of colonial domination, we find a culture which is rigid in the extreme, or rather what we find are the dregs of culture in mineral strata. The withering away of the reality of the nation and the death pangs of the national culture are linked to each other in mutual dependencies. This is why it is of capital importance to follow the evolution of these relations during the struggle for national freedom. The negation of the native's culture, the contempt for any manifestation of culture, whether active or emotional, and the placing outside the pale of all specialized branches of organization contribute to breed aggressive patterns of conduct in the native. But these patterns of conduct are of the reflexive type. They are poorly differentiated, anarchic and ineffective. Colonial exploitation, poverty, and endemic famine drive the native more and more to open, organized revolt. The necessity for an open and decisive breach is formed progressively and imperceptibly and comes to be felt by the great majority of the people. Those tensions which hitherto were non-existent come into being. International events, the collapse of whole sections of colonial empires, and the contradictions inherent in the colonial system strengthen and uphold the natives' combativity while promoting and giving support to national consciousness. These newfound tensions, which are present at all stages in the real nature of colonialism, have their repercussions on the cultural plane. In literature, for example, there is relative overproduction. From being a reply on a minor scale to the dominating power, the literature produced by natives becomes differentiated and makes itself into a will to particularism. The intelligentsia, which during the period of repression was essentially a consuming public, now themselves become producers. The literature at first chooses to confine itself to the tragic and poetic style, but later on novels, short stories, and essays are attempted. It is as if a kind of internal organization or law of expression existed which wills that poetic expression become less frequent in proportion as the objectives and the methods of the struggle for liberation becomes more precise. Themes are completely altered. In fact, we find less and less of bitter, hopeless recrimination and less also of that violent, resounding, florid writing which on the whole serves to reassure the occupying power. The colonialists have in former times encouraged these modes of expression and made their existence possible. Stinging denunciations, the exposing of distressing conditions, and the passions which find their outlet in expression are in fact assimilated by the occupying power in a cathartic process. To aid such processes is in a certain sense to avoid their dramatization and to clear the atmosphere. But such a situation can only be transitory. In fact, the progress of national consciousness among people modifies and gives precision to the literary utterances of the native intellectual. The continued cohesion of the people constitutes for the intellectual an invitation to go farther than his cry of protest. The lament first makes the indictment, then it makes an appeal. In the period that follows, the words of command are heard. 
the crystallization of the national consciousness will both disrupt literary styles and themes and also create a completely new public. While at the beginning the native intellectual used to produce his work to be read exclusively by the oppressor, whether with the intention of charming him or of denouncing him through ethnical and subjectivist means, now the native writer progressively takes on the habit of addressing his own people. It is only from that moment that we can speak of a national literature. Here there is, at the level of literary creation, the taking up and clarification of themes which are typically nationalist. This may be properly called a literature of combat in the sense that it calls on the whole people to fight for their existence as a nation. It is a literature of combat because it molds the national consciousness, giving it form and contours and flinging open before it new and boundless horizons. It is a literature of combat because it assumes responsibility and because it is the will to liberty expressed in terms of space and time. On another level, the oral tradition, stories, epics, and songs of the people, which formerly were filed away as set pieces, are now beginning to change. The storytellers who used to relate inert episodes now bring them alive and introduce them, modifications which are increasingly fundamental. There is a tendency to bring conflicts up to date and to use and modernize the kinds of struggle which the stories evoke, together with the names of heroes and the types of weapons. The method of illusion is more and more widely used. The formula, quote, this all happened long ago, is substantiated by that of, quote, what are we going to speak of happened somewhere else, but it might well have happened here today, and it might happen tomorrow." Unquote. The example of Algeria is significant in this context. From 1952 to 1953 on, the storytellers, who were before that time stereotyped and tedious to listen to, completely overturned their traditional methods of storytelling in the content of their tales. Their public, which was formerly scattered, became compact. The epic, with its typified categories, reappeared. It became authentic forms of entertainment, which took on once more a cultural value. Colonialism made no mistake when from 1955 on it proceeded to arrest these storytellers systematically. The contact of the people with the new movement gives rise to a new rhythm of life and to forgotten muscular tensions and develops the imagination. Every time the storyteller relates a fresh episode to his public, he presides over a real invocation. The existence of a new type of man is revealed to the public. The present is no longer turned in upon itself, but spread out for all to see. The storyteller once more gives free reign to his imagination. He makes invocations and he creates a work of art. It even happens that the characters, which are barely ready for such a transformation, highway robbers or more or less antisocial vagabonds, are taken up and remodeled. The emergence of the imagination and of the creative urge in the songs and epic stories of a colonized country is worth following. The storyteller replies to the expectant people by successive approximations and by his way, apparently alone, but in fact helped on by his public toward the seeking out of new patterns, that is to say national patterns. Comedy and farce disappear or lose their attraction. As for dramatization, it is no longer placed on the plane of the troubled intellectual and his tormented conscience. By losing its characteristics of despair and revolt, the drama becomes part of the common lot of the people and forms part of an action in preparation or already in progress. When handicrafts are concerned, 
the forms of expression which formerly were the dregs of art, surviving as if in a daze, now begin to reach out. Woodwork, for example, which formerly turned out certain faces and attitudes by the million, begins to be differentiated. The inexpressive or overwrought mask comes to life, and the arms tend to be raised from the body as if to sketch an action. Compositions containing two, three, or five figures appear. The traditional schools are led on to creative efforts by the rising avalanche of amateurs or of critics. This new vigor in this section of cultural life is very often past unseen, and yet its contribution to the national efforts of its capital importance. By carving figures and faces which are full of life, and by taking as his theme a group fixed on the same pedestal, the artist invites participation in an organized movement. If we study the repercussions of the awakenings of national consciousness in the domains of ceramics and pottery making, the same observations may be drawn. Formalism is abandoned in the craftsman's work. Jugs, jars, and trays are modified, at first imperceptibly, then almost savagely. The colors, of which formerly there were few, but which obeyed the traditional rules of harmony, increase in number and are influenced by the repercussion of the rising revolution. Certain ochres and blues, which seemed forbidden to all eternity in a given cultural area, now assert themselves without giving rise to scandal. In the same way, the stylization of the human face, which according to sociologists is typical of very clearly defined regions, becomes suddenly completely relative. The specialists coming from the home country and the ethnologist are quick to note these changes. On the whole, such changes are condemned in the name of a rigid code of artistic style and of a cultural life which grows up at the heart of the colonial system. The colonialist specialists does not recognize these new forms and rush to the help of the traditions of the indigenous society. It is the colonialists who become the defenders of the native style. We remember perfectly, and the example took on a certain measure of importance since the real nature of colonialism was not involved, the reactions of the white jazz specialists after the Second World War, new styles such as bebop, took definite shape. The fact is that in their eyes, jazz should only be the despairing, broken-down nostalgia of an old Negro who is trapped between five glasses of whiskey, the curse of his race, and the racial hatred of the white men. As soon as the Negro comes to an understanding of himself and understands the rest of the world differently, when he gives birth to hope and forces back the racist universe, it is clear that his trumpet sounds more clearly and his voice less hoarsely. The new fashions in jazz are not simply born of economic competition. We must, without any doubt, see in them one of the consequences of the defeat, slow but sure, of the southern world of the United States. And it is not utopian to suppose that in 50 years' time, the type of jazz howl hiccuped by a poor, misfortunate Negro will be upheld only by the whites who believe in it as an expression of Negrohood and who are faithful to this arrested image of a type of relationship. We might, in the same way, seek and find in dancing, singing, and tradition, rites and ceremonies, the same upward springing trend, and make out the same changes and the same impatience in this field. We, well before the political or fighting phase of the national movement, an attentive Spectator can thus feel and see the manifestation of new vigor and feel the approaching conflict. He will note unusual forms of expression and themes 
which are fresh and imbued with a power which is no longer that of invocation, but rather of the assembling of the people, a summoning together for a precise purpose. Everything works together to awaken the native's sensibility and to make unreal and inacceptable the contemplative attitude or the acceptance of defeat. The native rebuilds his perception because he renews the purpose and dynamism of the craftsman, of dancing and music and of literature and the oral tradition. His world comes to lose its accursed character. The conditions necessary for the inevitable conflict are brought together. We have noted the appearance of the movement in cultural forms, and we have seen that this movement and these new forms are linked to the state of maturity of the national consciousness. Now this movement tends more and more to express itself objectively in institutions. From thence comes the need for a national existence, whatever the cost. A frequent mistake, and one which is moreover hardly justifiable, is to try and find cultural expression for, and to give new values to, native culture within the framework of colonial domination. This is why we arrive at a proposition which at first sight seems paradoxical. The fact that in a colonized country, the most elementary, most savage, and the most undifferentiated nationalism is the most fervent and efficient means of defending natural culture. For culture, it is first the expression of a nation, the expression of its preferences, of its taboos, and of its patterns. It is at every stage of the whole of society that other taboos, values, and patterns are formed. A national culture is the sum total of all these appraisals. It is the result of internal and external extensions of exerted over society as a whole and also at every level of that society. In the colonial situation, culture, which is doubly deprived of the support of the nation and of the state, falls away and dies. The condition for its existence is therefore national liberation and the renaissance of the state. The nation is not only the condition of culture, its fruitfulness, its continual renewal, and its deepening. It is also a necessity. It is the fight for national existence which sets culture moving and opens to it the doors of creation. Later on, it is the nation which will ensure the conditions and framework necessary to culture. The nation gathers together the various indispensable elements necessary for the creation of a culture, those elements which alone can give it credibility, validity, life, and creative power. In the same way, it is its national character that will make such a culture open to other cultures and which will enable it to influence and permeate other cultures. A non-existent culture can hardly be expected to have bearing on reality or to influence reality. The first necessity is the re-establishment of the nation in order to give life to national culture in a strictly biological sense of the phrase. Thus we have followed the breakup of the old strata of culture, a shattering which becomes increasingly fundamental, and we have noticed on the eve of the decisive conflict for national freedom, the renewing of forms of expression and the rebirth of the imagination. There remains one essential question. What are the relations between the struggle, whether political or military, and culture? Is there a suspension of culture during the conflict? Is the national struggle an expression of a culture? Finally, ought one to say that the battle for freedom, however fertile a posteriori with regard to culture, is in itself a negation of culture? In short, the struggle for liberation, a cultural phenomenon or not? We believe that the conscious and organized undertaking by a colonized people to re-establish the sovereignty of that nation 
constitutes the most complete and obvious cultural manifestation that exists. It is not alone the success of the struggle which afterwards gives validity and vigor to culture. Culture is not put into cold storage during the conflict. The struggle itself, in its development and in its internal progress and progression, sends culture along different paths and traces out entirely new ones for it. The struggle for freedom does not give back to the national culture its former value and shapes. This struggle, which aims at a fundamentally different set of relations between men, cannot leave intact either the form of content or the people's culture. After the conflict, there is not only the disappearance of colonialism, but also the disappearance of the colonized man. This new humanity cannot do otherwise than define a new humanism both for itself and for others. It is prefigured in the objections and methods of the conflict, a struggle which mobilizes all classes of the people and which expresses their aims and their impatience, which is not afraid to count almost exclusively on the people's support, will of necessity triumph. The value of this type of conflict is that it supplies the maximum of conditions necessary for the development and aims of culture. After national freedom has been obtained in these conditions, there is no such painful cultural indecision which is found in certain countries which are newly independent, because the nation, by its manner of coming into being and the terms of its existence, exerts a fundamental influence over culture. A nation which is born of the people's constant concerted efforts and which embodies the real aspirations of the people while changing the state cannot exist save in the expression of an exceptionally rich forms of culture. The natives who are anxious for the culture of their country and who wish to give it a universal dimension ought not therefore to place their confidence in a single principle of inevitable indifferentiated independence written into the consciousness of the people in order to achieve their task. The liberation of the nation is one thing. The methods and popular content of the fight are another. It seems to me that the future of national culture and its riches are equally also part and parcel of the values which have ordained the struggle for freedom. And now it is time to denounce certain phrases. National claims, it is here and there stated, are a phase that humanity has left behind. It is the day of great concerted action, and retarded nationalists ought in consequence to set their mistakes aright. We, however, consider that the mistake, which may have very serious consequences, lies in wishing to skip the national period, if culture is the expression of national consciousness, I will not hesitate to infirm that in the case with which we are dealing, it is the national consciousness which is the most elaborate form of culture. The consciousness of self is not the closing of a door to communication. Philosophic thought teaches us, on the contrary, that it is guarantee. National consciousness, which is not nationalism, is the only thing that will give us an international dimension. This problem of national consciousness and of national culture takes on, in Africa, a special dimension. The birth of national consciousness in Africa has a strictly contemporaneous connection with the African consciousness. The responsibility of the African as regards to national culture is also responsible with regard to African Negro culture. This joint responsibility is not the fact of a metaphysical principle, but the awareness of a simple rule which wills that every independent nation in an Africa where colonialism is still entrenched is an encircled nation, a nation which is fragile and in permanent danger. If man is known by his acts, and then we will say that the most urgent things today are for the intellectual is to build up his nation. 
if this building up is true, that is to say, if it interprets the manifest will of the people and reveals the eager African peoples, then the building of a nation is of necessity accompanied by the discovery and encouragement of universalizing values. Far from keeping aloof from other nations, therefore, it is national liberation which leads the nation to play its part on the stage of history. It is at the heart of national consciousness that international consciousness lives and grows, and this twofold emerging is ultimately the source of all culture.